right. I think it's time to welcome everybody back from break um, and to let everybody know that we're going to start the next part of our uh, afternoon with Janelle Amelli from 3Cat Max presenting on her uniquely painted puzzles, inviting chaos with watercolors on wood. As we've been doing all along, please write your questions into the Zoom chat and she'll be answering any questions you have after the video. So Janelle, if you're there, ready to take it away, you may start. Like Ross said, I'm Janelle and I am down here in a beautiful sunny slash rainy day of Georgia and uh, pretty much everything else is on the video. So uh, I believe it's Chris, go ahead and play that video. Right, you got it, Janelle. Thank you. Hi, my name is Janelle Amelli, and I'm the owner and designer at 3catmax.com, where I create curiously peculiar puzzles to torture your friends and family with. Today, I will be talking about how I invite chaos with watercolors on wood, and a little bit about what led me to this process. When I first started cutting wooden puzzles, I had this really big problem that I had to get creative to solve, and that was, how do I get a colorful image on wood? Well, most people would print out an image on a piece of paper and glue it on, but I don't have a color printer and I don't have the right types of glue. And I also don't have access to a UV printer where I could literally print directly on the wood. So I had to get a little creative to solve this problem. So I tested out a couple of mediums. I tried acrylic paint and alcohol inks and finally, I found that if I gessoed a piece of plywood, I could paint it with watercolors and get really interesting variations of depth and color with the watercolors that I couldn't get with the acrylic paint. So I continued the experiment and created this cherry blossom puzzle that I watercolor painted. And boy, do I just love the way that the color just moved across the wood and I could get it to saturate in some spots. And it was just, Beautiful. So I gifted this cherry blossom puzzle experiment to my mentor, who immediately came back and was like, I need to commission a puzzle right now. My father's retiring. He's been teaching at the University of Arizona. He's been teaching astronomy for years and years and years. He's been running the summer camp at Kitts Peak, and I want a puzzle of Kitts Peak for his retirement. My family is absolutely crazy about puzzles. So what do we need to do to make a Kitts Peak puzzle? I'll be the first person to tell you that I am really not a painter. I am much more towards a sculptural thing most of the time with my art. But in this case, I created more or less a paint by number where I could create the image on the computer, engrave it onto the wood, paint it and not have to worry about getting any of the lines or perspectives or anything right now. I'm just filling in paint in the number squares, right? And then I can create my second layer of art, which is the puzzle shapes, including all of the whimsies that I wanted to add. In this case, they're all very Arizona specific whimsies that have to do with the different um, astronomy related things, such as the astronomy camp that her dad ran for many, many, many years and where she met her husband and their whole family went to for years and years and years. So I was incredibly honored to be part of this project. Another example of using this watercolor technique is Morty the Cat. It was so fun to come up with a bunch of whimsies specifically about Morty, including his fat silhouette in his personal basket, as well as the little bell that he would ding for treats. With that little bit of groundwork laid, let's get to the step-by-step -step of creating one of these watercolor puzzles. And what better way to do that than to document the process on my last custom puzzle. Dawn contacted me with the idea of creating a Sonoran Desert Sunrise for her 50th birthday. One, because her name is Dawn, and two, because she loves Arizona Desert Sunrises, and she lives in Arizona and loves hiking there. The first step in creating any custom puzzle is to set up a consultation call. And at this point, I get to ask her what it is that she actually is thinking about in a puzzle, what kind of imagery, um, is she trying to capture any type of memories, what kind of whimsies can we add in? And we hash out some ideas and some possibilities. 
Now is the gathering phase. I'll start searching for images for inspiration. I'll look on Google and Pinterest and I'm searching for Arizona desert sunrise, Sonoran desert animals, Arizona cacti, desert landscape paintings, just anything that I can gather to start these ideas rumbling in my head. In my pre-art thinking phase, I like to start playing with the images that I've collected. So in this case, I'm looking at the animals and I'm gonna start tracing them to be possible whimsies. I'm probably not gonna use all of them that I end up tracing out, but at this time, I'm also thinking a lot. I'm like putting, you know, placing things around in my mind, uh, placing whimsies, or in this case, their landscapes are like a lot of animals and cactus. And I'm kind of placing them around, trying to figure out how things are going to be laid out. For those interested in the tech side of things, I'm using an Android tablet and the art app Concepts. I tested a whole lot of different apps, and this has the best interface and allows me to export into Inkscape in SVG paths, which is what the laser will use to cut. We'll get into Inkscape later. But for now, and although I don't really have any more footage of this, I'm building the image together. I'm taking these whimsies and I'm placing them around. I'm roughly drawing and scribbling, trying to get an idea of how I'm going to place things out until eventually I come up with this image. Here you can see all of the different animals and how they're arranged in this Sonoran Desert portrait. Now a lot of these animals are going to be painted into the background, so they'll be basically invisible. Some of them will be just painted as themselves or color line cut. Next, I create my puzzle layer on top of my art layer. So all of these are going to be the actual cuts of the puzzle. And I also add the text when I move it into Inkscape. Then I bring the digital image into the physical world by printing it out and then marking it all up in areas that are end up being too small, too large, uh, fix up all the lines to make a better puzzle overall. After this first round of edits, I'm going to bring it into the laser cutting software so that I can make a wooden prototype that I cut out of Lawan. Now Lawan is a really fluffy soft wood that would make a horrible long-term puzzle, but to test it works really well because I can cut on it really fast. Once cut, I'm going to take this out, move it around on the table, make sure the outside edge interlocks and do another round of edits on this physical product. Again, I'm just gonna mark up the top and tell me where I need to fix things. Here is a finished version of the puzzle with the customizations removed. It's been cut out of quarter inch maple plywood, sanded on both sides, and then polished on the top with a penetrating oil. Dawn wanted to share this puzzle with her friends, but without the customizations on the top. Now we get into the watercolor version of this puzzle. So what I've done so far is I've taken that quarter inch maple and I have added a coat of gesso, covered it in adhesive masking to protect from smoke and resin redeposit from the laser cutting, and then put it through the laser and scored the design on there. Scoring with the laser just cuts the top surface of the wood, which really helps to create a barrier for the watercolor to stay in its cells. But you can also over flood them. But it's easy to fix, I just sop it up with the paintbrush. Primed wood is a much different surface than watercolor paper. It's not going to react the same. I can get some of the same haloing, but in general, I can pretty much wipe away anything and start over again. I feel like this whole process is about adding color and removing color, repeatedly. So in this case, I added a streak of yellow, but then I used that saturated area to push around the color and swab it around to where I wanted it without it being super duper saturated. Here I added another layer of color, just dabbing it on really gently, trying not to disturb the layer below. And this is the opposite. I'm actually wetting it and then removing color because I feel like it got too saturated. I really like the placement of this Gila monster on the Ocetillo bush which has been fatted up to make it easily paintable. But by putting it on top of the bush, it basically gives him stripes, even though they aren't orange and red stripes. To add a little wispy pink into the sky, I'm going to pile on a lot of pink and then just wipe it right back off with a paper towel, just leaving enough 
to give it a delicate coloration. And here is a finished Arizona sunrise with the landscape all purple and blue because the sun rays haven't hit it yet. Now that I'm done painting, I add another sheet of adhesive masking to protect the painting and cut it in the laser. And it's the worst part because basically I just finished this beautiful painting that I put hours into and I'm just going to cut it into pieces. And I don't even watch because it's just too nerve wracking. To remove my puzzles from the laser cutter, I use another piece of adhesive masking that I burnish onto the wood. And that way I can flip the whole thing over, capturing about 95% or more of all of the puzzle pieces. Unfortunately for this tortoise, he got left behind. Here is the back of the finished puzzle. And just for fun, here is a time lapse of me assembling it that is 32 times faster than I actually assembled it. Even though I'm pretty dang familiar with every single one of these pieces, it still took that long. I believe that Dawn is a prenatal nurse or something pretty similar. So I added lots of baby critters. So there's like a baby owl and a little baby bunny that you can't see because it's painted into the background. But I really like this family of peccaries right in the front. And there's two little heart pieces connecting them. Otherwise, they're kind of large pieces, but they are adorable. And you wouldn't believe how difficult it is to tint brown with purple and blue to get them kind of a subdued color to max match with the rest of the landscape. And also, cat cameo, intern Peanut decided he really needed to be part of this video and he wouldn't leave me alone while I put it together. <laughs> After I finish laser cutting the puzzle and removing all the masking, I will spray a clear sealant onto the puzzle to protect the watercolor. Otherwise, it would just wash off the wood. And the absolutely finished puzzle sealed and ready to be shipped out to Arizona. Now here is a little extra a sweet little puzzle that I created that actually also went to Dawn. But there's a really funny story about what happened. So Dawn had contacted me about a custom puzzle like months before her birthday. And then the week before her birthday, her friend contacts me and says, Hey, is there anything that you have that you know that Dawn doesn't have already of your puzzles? And... And I just thought it was so funny that her friend also wanted to give her one of my puzzles. And I had come up with this really cool idea of tessellating puzzle pieces that I used a different app for that I'm in a beta test. It's called Cuddle. And it's used for um, plotting machines like CNC's and laser cutters and say Cricut uh, cutters. So I created this tessellating design of swirlies, like little um, flower swirlies. And I had test cut the puzzle out and it was cool, but it was really boring because there was no color. It was just plain wood. So when Dawn's friend was like, hey, do you have anything that you know she doesn't have? I was like, hey, back of my head, I've always wanted to paint this puzzle. And I've never had the time to do it. And now I can totally do it. And Dawn's going to love it because Dawn loves really bright uh, warm colors so I painted it up and I really wanted to get like splotches of color all over and nothing too crazy big because the puzzle pieces themselves are pretty small so then I cut it out and it actually took quite a long time to cut out because of all of those swirls so once it was done um Man, I just love the way it turned out. It's so fun to put together. There's so many different colors and combinations that you can, I mean, you can p place them together any way that you want. And I figured it would be a great um, coffee table puzzle to just kind of leave out and play with when you need to have your mind shut up for a while. So this also went out to Dawn and surprised her for her birthday. And it was, it was awesome. It was really fun. Now this 36 piece tessellation puzzle is up on my website along with a couple of these other ones. The sunflower mandala, um, this geode mandala, and my lucky puzzles that I had made for St. Patrick's but I was too slow and I didn't finish them until later. And um, they're actually cut out of fourth inch poplar plank. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. And again, my website is 3 k 
catmax.com. There you can find many of the puzzles that I just showed you, as well as my shimmery acrylic puzzles. Also, in honor of the puzzle parley, any orders this weekend will get one of these butterfly puzzles that looks like this. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Bye! So like I said, uh, any questions? I noticed Melinda asked a question that said, uh, how did you seal the wood before the gesso? And I wasn't aware that you were supposed to seal the wood before the gesso, so I haven't been. I just use uh, about two or three layers of professional gesso, Liquitex, and, and then I do a layer of sanding, like a quick hit the top of anything that's giving any too much texture. And maybe you meant sealing the back of the wood, which actually happens. <laughs> um, I'm laughing because, oh, I, I didn't catch who it was, but like talking about trademark ears, I almost forgot them. I forgot them at first. I was like, crap, I gotta put the ears on. Um, <laughs> so with the back of the puzzles, I don't put any sealer on until after I've cut it and then sanded it and um, removed the sawdust because when you sand puzzles, it makes a freaking mess and all the cracks. So then I remove all the sawdust, which currently I'm doing by hand because I don't have like pantyhose on a piece of vacuum so that I can easily do that without losing the pieces. Um, but I use this, it's called Odie's Wood Butter and it's super concentrated, it's food safe and it smells delicious and doesn't have like the evaporating crap that you normally get from a lot of varnishes and stuff. So this little thing will last years and years and years and years and you can actually get, um, a, it's a spray can of nitrogen to kind of it's a really heavy gas i think it's nitrogen but it's a heavy gas that lays on top of the surface because i've only used about a quarter inch of this and if you leave it it literally um will plasticize on top so by lay layering the gas on there it keeps it keeps the oxygen out so it doesn't oxidize so um, who is supposed to be finding questions, if there are any? I know Melinda volunteered at one point. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm okay. here. I'm watching. Um, it seems like everybody really enjoyed that. I certainly did and gave you a couple of questions. They liked your ears. Um, <laughs> I don't see any more questions right now. Oh, one other thing is um, I do have painted puzzles for sale, but for a little bit less. I'm also selling some blanks. So if you want to try out this technique and paint them yourself, you can get that and try them yourself. 